You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome Welcome to to the the Advisor's Advisor's Option, Option. the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the The Advisor's advisor's option. Option. All right, everybody, that music means we are back once again, ready to kick off the new year here on the Advisors Option, the program for you, the busy financial advisor or asset manager who maybe is a little bit options curious, shall we say, or maybe you've been using these products for a long time and you want to take a deeper dive. Either way, we got you covered here. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the T-H-E, OptionsInsider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you are binging these days. Remember, if you are an active advisor out there using options or intrigued by options, a lot of great other content on the network to help you out, including a lot of great educational content. Of course, Options Bootcamp, Options Playbook Radio, two great choices, hundreds of episodes each of those. So if you really want to dive deep into the educational side, those are there for you. If you want to go a little bit deeper into some other areas, maybe volatility, we have volatility views, futures options this week and futures options, you name it. We have a program geared around it here on the network. So wherever you're getting the advisor's option, make sure you're listening to the full network. If you do like what you hear, a rating, a comment, all that fun stuff at the end of the day does help new people continue to discover the content. As we discover who's joining us on the old advisor's option program this month. First, let's go out to sunny New Hampshire where things are busy. New Hampshire very much in the headlines right now, kicking off primary season here in the U.S. So he dragged himself away just to join us for the program today. Mr. Matt Amberson, the founder over there at ORATS, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology Services. Mr. Matt, welcome back to the Advisor's Options, sir. It has been too long. It has been uh, very topical, Mark. Yeah, we have uh, 
Uh, it's my least favorite season. There's signs all over the place, <laughs> and they're calling people relentlessly, and uh, it's just an, an ugly time. We're, we're glad to have it uh, behind us now, Mark. Imagine if you lived in that Dixville Notch town, how besieged you would be. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah. be thankful the compound is not there. And also joining us here for the first episode of the new year. He's been on this show, but it's been a little while. It's been all the way back since September of 2022 that we've chatted with this fellow, at least on this program. You've heard him make frequent pit stops, though, over there on the Crypto Rundown. Our old pal, Mr. Bill Ulibarri, the principal over there at Senecal Capital Management. Mr. Bill, welcome back to the Advisor's Option, and Happy New Year to you as well, sir. Happy New Year to you, too. Matt, Happy New Year. It's great to be back on this show. I'm super stoked for this one. All yeah, right. it's going to be good, though. All right, Thanks should be a fun time. one. So let's get to it. A little bit of the old p l statement. What the heck happened in the options markets since our last episode? Let's find out with the p l statement. All right, everyone. Welcome to the p l statement, the segment born of the pandemic because so much crazy crap was happening in between episodes. We spent a lot of time at the top of every show just talking about what the hell just happened. Uh, so it, it became its own segment here. Uh, we're going to do a little bit differently this time because, as I said, this is our first episode of the new year. And so it's our opportunity to take our final look back on the mad year, the maelstrom that was 2023 from a variety of different perspectives, from an overall options perspective, volatility, general markets, highlights, lowlights, a lot of different ways we could slice this onion. Uh, Mr. Bill, as our guest, you get pride of place, sir. When you look back at the mad tumultuous year that was 2023, uh, what really stands out? What resonates to you, sir? You know, I just think what resonates to me are is the the continued rally in uh, interest rates. You know, again, Fed funds being at five and a quarter percent. Um, the Bitcoin ETF being approved finally uh, at the first, you know, the first week of January 2024. But you know, something that was kind of, we were given the heads up a little bit at the end of December, uh, and and I would say probably the greater adoption of Bitcoin, uh, the JP Morgan collateralized. Uh, and tokenized network, a lot of cool stuff on the crypto side. But from our perspective, you know, every bad year in the market, like 2022, is generally followed by a really good year. And boy, we saw that in the QQQ NASDAQ and in the S&P 500. That we did out there, sir. This time a year ago when we were doing our pro Q&As and having everyone on the network to kind of get their thoughts on the year to come. I don't think a single person had an AI-driven massive explosion in the market. <laughs> Everyone was talking about the virtues of cash and being very defensive to kick off the year, aggressive rate increases. No one thought the market was going to do what it did last year. So a uh, very, very intriguing stuff. Mr. Matt, we turn to you now, sir. As you look back on the mad year that was 2023, what stands out? What are the takeaways for you, sir? Yeah, I mean, we, we did have some volatility. We had some uh, good tumult. But uh, as you said, it, it was just a relentless bull, just keeping this market up. And you know, the Fed just uh, did whatever they could to, to keep pushing it up. And and you know, the congressmen are making money trading uh, stock. And and now we're coming into a big uh, election year. So you know, what are they going to do? What's going to happen? I mean, there's so many things that could have gone wrong in the market with Ukraine and, and what's going on in the Middle East. But nothing seemed to phase this market, you know. Um, you know, for me, I, you know, obviously, I, I was, uh, I, I'm always a little bearish, being an ex-market maker. But you know, luckily, we just we followed our signals, and, and falling volatility is good for is good for the market. So uh, you know, our, our our kind of trading that uh, you know that I do in my personal accounts, you know, it did pretty well. But my overall hedges, they're not doing good. But the the underlying, uh, I don't know, it's a crazy, I think it's kind of a crazy market, Mark. Like you said, you know, who would have uh, picked up on their, their lottery ticket? AI drives the market to all-time highs. Uh, so, yeah, it was a pretty crazy year, and we'll see what happens in 2024. Yes. Who knows? Who knows, indeed. So far, we are recording this, listeners, in tail end of January here. So we have a little bit of a taste of what 2024 is going to bring us. And so far... It's a lot more of the same, listeners. Our markets are mostly green. Kicked off the year a little bit turbulent, a little bit frothy in the red, but since then, mostly has trended towards the green, setting new highs in the S&P 
seems like every session for the better part of the last week out there, Vol continuing to come in, the VIX down, a back, a kissed last week when I was doing that panel, we kissed a 15 handle out there in VIX land, and I got a little happy. I was like, okay, there we go. That's a level I can get behind. This sub-13 VIX is for the birds. That gives me flashbacks to the terrible dark year that was 2017, where if you were trading in the options market, you know, volatility went to die, volume went to die, a lot of firms went to die, a lot of firms went out of business that year. It was a, a rough year for the options market. No one wants a repeat of that. So whenever I see a 12 handle floating around in VIX and starting to trend towards the lower end of the teens, dare I say at the single digits, I start to get a little bit of PTSD from, from 2017. But that said, we're not quite there yet. Let's go around the horn again. Mr. Bill, we have a few weeks of this new year under our belts, including we can't bury the lead anymore. Certainly from your perspective, the big development is, of course, the approval of this Bitcoin ETF. Uh, this has been driving the crypto side of the space for months now. The better part of last year, we saw this protracted rally in all things crypto, particularly Bitcoin, just on the whisper, the rumor that this approval was going to happen. Now we have a bunch of new spot Bitcoin ETFs hitting the market. And on the flip side, Bill, I don't think I've ever seen in recent memory a better example of buy the rumor, sell the fact type of trade because they bought these things all the way up until the ETF was approved and now they're selling the hell out of them. Bitcoin was threatening 40,000 again in the wrong direction, down about 7,000 handles from when this ETF got approved. Everything else, Solana, ETH, all taking it on the chin out there. So it's been a wild ride out there, Bill, just in the first few weeks of the year here, sir. Uh, walk us through it. And also, you know, this Bitcoin ETF, this is the thing everyone has been talking about for years. This was supposed to be the watershed event, the moment when crypto really stepped in and broke through into the mainstream. Uh, what are your thoughts on it so far? Is it living up to the hype for you? Well, I would say the answer is, um, you know, I, I, I can make an argument for both the positive and the negative side. So, Yes, this hype, you know, this sell the, um, you know, buy the buy the the rumor and sell the news kind of mentality. The last time we had an event like this that was so profound was right before the CME group listed their Bitcoin futures, like in 20, the end of 2017, I think it was, maybe uh, 2018, where, you know, Bitcoin just got slammed for about 50% after, you know, the futures contracts were trading. So, yeah, as a floor trader, this was like a no-brainer, you know, when they're just, when the media is just pumping this stuff like crazy, you've got to let a couple of chips, you know, cash in a few chips. But, you know, I'm encouraged that that Bitcoin is uh, achieving more and greater adoption. Uh, I'm excited, um, actually, in some respects for the ETF sponsors who are now able to charge more than zero, you know, annual management fee and expense ratios on their on their ETFs. Um, I'm I'm just I'm really excited about the whole thing, Mark, because again, I believe that we've entered this really new age, this parallel universe, this parallel system where just as text messages and media communication has been like dematerialized, you know, call it what you will, from hardcore, you know, hard. Uh, brick and mortar newspaper firms and media to our electronic uh, content that we consume on Facebook and Twitter and all the electronic platforms and podcasts. The same thing is going to be happening with our financial network with money. And that's going to be, you know, we've had the industrial revolution. We've had the uh, information age. And I think now we're going to kind of get in this, this money age, this, this incredible revolution in finance and collateral and moving things around the globe instantaneously. So I'm super, super excited, and the Bitcoin ETF approval is just the beginning of what is going to be an incredible 10 or 12 years going forward. You know, it's funny, Bill, the last time you joined us, the only real viable option for any advisors who wanted to touch digital assets was Grayscale. Uh, that was your favorite for a long time, I know, as well. They kind of led the charge to get this ETF approved. They have now switched to an ETF structure. They may have kind of shot themselves in the foot too. If you've seen the headlines now, a lot of money flowing out of the grayscale and into the other alternate ETFs out there, Bill. So maybe they uh, they rose the tide, but they shot themselves in the foot at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see why you'd say that for sure. Um, but you know, it's it's only been about a twelve days, right? Twelve, thirteen days. So let's just see how this plays out. 
Uh, again, Bitcoin already, you know, yeah, maybe maybe some money spread out to some of the other Bitcoin ETFs, but the, I think Grayscale has like 11 more. You know, they've got an Ethereum, they have a, a large cap, you know, GDLC, I think the symbol is, large cap, uh, you know, cryptocurrency fund. They have uh, Chainlink and Horizon and Ethereum Classic and other tokens. So, you know, it's, it's not over yet uh, with Grayscale. And again, they were the first, my first date to the dance, so to speak. Uh, and I'm, I, I still like what they're doing. And now I've got a, you know, 10 more exchange traded funds to look at and review and analyze. And each one's going to have its own flavor and its own um, attributes. So that, that's the, the, my work is really just beginning now. Your work has just begun, sir. Well, our audience has been all over this for a while. Uh, they were actually thinking it would come a little earlier. We did a poll last year uh, towards the, let's say, Q4 of last year, asking quite simply, oh, it was around Thanksgiving. That's right. It was Thanksgiving week. So pretty much the final month and change of the year, we asked you, hey, everyone's buying crypto anticipation of the new spot ETF coming this year. Do you think we're going to see it last year? Yes or no? And 56% of you said yes. So you folks were all over it. Uh, you thought it was going to come even before the end of the year. Didn't quite get it in there. But we did get it, obviously, early in this new year. And now that the now that the ETF is approved, now that we have it in our hot little hands, uh, we thought we'd ask you folks, has this changed your sentiment at all? Where do you think Bitcoin will finish on the year, positive or negative? And 56.7% of you said it's going to close positive on the year, even though the near-term data, not exactly backing that up. Bitcoin back below, I just checked, back below 40K now, down over 7,000 handles from where it was when the ETF was approved. So in the immediate blush, has not exactly been bullish, but uh, intriguing out there. Uh, Mr. Matt, a lot to check in with you on as well. Obviously, the year off to an interesting start across the board in the equity space. A lot of the same. We have green on the screen. We have red on the ball screen and everybody obsessed with AI. But on the crypto front, we also have this kind of watershed moment as well. So a lot to keep an eye on, a lot to keep track of. What's catching your eye here in the first few weeks of the new year? Well, Mark, we go way back. I think I was I the one of the first guests on your crypto uh, podcast. So. You might have been. You and I also, and, and also Bill also did that conference out on, yeah. uh, was it Navy Pier years ago? <laughs> yes. So yeah, it's been right. a while. So, and I've, you know, I've been involved in my son. This is uh, his birthday is today, 18. And I was thinking that I spoke at this anarchist conference uh, on, um, on parenting uh, at, at Universal Studios. I think my son was like three or four. So that law and, and they had a that's when i first heard about bitcoin they had a booth there and i'm like what are you guys talking about <laughs> and like no idea and you know every uh they this kept at me and they kept you know okay all right i'll buy a little bit but i i'm holding my nose because i'm a finance guy it makes no sense to me uh how do we know that, that everyone else is just not going to make uh bitcoins and bitcoin twos and bitcoin threes but you know, over the years, I've become a, a partial believer. I'm still, uh, I'm always skeptical of uh, anyone competing with the Fed because bankers don't like competition. And so I still, I still get a little bit cr cringy when I see, uh, you know, the SEC approving this. I just go, there's got to be, there's got to be something else uh, here. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ambivalent about Bitcoin. I, I love what it stands for, but I, uh, you know, just think that. You know, we're, the the forces that are competing with it, i.e., you know, all the bankers are are way too strong and they control way too much stuff. So, you know, I just uh, I'm uh, it, it, it's a very uh, tenuous thing, I think, and it's going to be you know it's going to be fun to watch, but you know, people have to be very careful. So that's how I feel about uh, Bitcoin. You know, grayscale too you know, on the ETFs. I mean, they're charged they're they're charging one point five percent. Which is the highest by far of any ETF. So yeah, they they've been seeing a lot of drain out of their ETF. I think that's that's a, a lot why. <clears throat> and then of course Fidelity's name of their uh, Bitcoin fund is FBTC. And if anyone's uh, ever seen that skit, uh, I'll, I'll pass over that. But it's a funny. Let's just say that it's a funny um, symbol. Uh, so yeah, so that's how I feel about. Uh, about uh, Bitcoin, yeah, and about 
um, you know, the options market, I mean, we're, we're busier than ever at ORATS, you know, we're getting clients, 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 and, and, you know, more and more people are trading options. Uh, there's much more sophistication, you know, that shows like this. And a, a lot of uh, what a, a lot of other people are doing, educators are really upping everyone's game. Uh, AI, you know, we, we've been dabbling in AI. Uh, there's a co company called Boosted AI that we've been dealing with for like five years. And finally, you know, people are kind of catching on. I mean, I think also, you know, obviously chat GPT has helped a lot, but, you know, that's all these things, you know, machine learning and, and the AI, you know, it helps, uh, you know, people that don't have all, all the capital, uh, you know, come up with some some edge in the markets, I think. And so, you know, they're, they come to us for data at ORATS, they come to us for tools. So, you know, that the interest and you just keep, you know, seeing the option market just expanding and expanding. And then, you know, there's just a lot of liquidity sloshing around out there. I mean, where where are people going to put their money? You know, they're putting it in stocks, even though by any measure, um, you know, it's very overvalued. So, you know, it's just a, it's just going to be interesting. And, and, you know, I think options are going to be important. You really have to watch your downside. Things could happen very quickly. But, you know, right now our signals are pretty positive. So that's how I'm looking at it, Mark. All right. And now it's time to keep on rolling into a very special Tricks of the Trade segment. And now it's time for practical tips on how to implement options into your practice. It's time to learn the tricks of the trade. All right, everyone, welcome to the Tricks of the Trade segment. This is the segment where we typically tell you some inside tips or techniques for how you can implement options and indeed derivatives in your clients' portfolios, how the pros like to do it. It's going to take a little bit of a sojourn from that, take a left turn out there into the realm of crypto. Now, I can th I can think back in the long history of this program. I can probably count on one hand the number of times we've talked about estate planning <laughs> on this program, and it's today. It is one. This is the first and indeed the only time we have ever discussed it on this program. That said, it is a big concern, I know, for a lot of the financial advisors and asset managers out there. So it is worthy of discussing it. And Going to take a little bit different approach to it today because our buddy, Mr. Bill, since the last time he joined us back in September of 2022, he's been a little busy. He is now a published author with a very intriguing tome to his name. It is called The Essential Estate Professionals Toolkit for Recovering Cryptocurrency. What happens to cryptocurrency when your client dies? So uh, fascinating stuff. Again, a niche unto himself. I can't really think of anyone else who's approached us to discuss this topic. So very unique unto Mr. Bill. So Mr. Bill, A, congratulations on finally getting the book out. I know it was no small amount of work. And B, uh, tell our listeners, tell our audience, tell the advisors out there, why did you decide to write this book? Oh my gosh, Mark, thank you so much. You know, when you say an, I'm a niche, all un, a niche all unto myself, it sounds like my wife or my kids saying, you know, Dad, it's just not all about you. And I'm like, oh yeah, it is. <laughs> um, but I had I used to run a meetup group in Glenview called the North Shore Bitcoin and Blockchain Meetup Group, and we've had attendees, you know, come in, some just for free pizza, some for camaraderie, and other ones, other guys would just sit and listen. And one of the gentlemen that uh, attended our events contacted me in 2021, in the fall of 2021, you know, near the peak of Ethereum and and Bitcoin, and during his years in retirement, he just decided to take a shot quote unquote, speculate in Ethereum as a token. And he had bought a lot of it. You know, he bought six figures worth of Ethereum uh, when it first was kind of introduced in 2016, I think it was 20, 2016, you know, around eight or $9 a token. And his little hobby, right, rather than playing golf or uh, skeet shooting or, you know, rowing or whatever, he decided to do technology as his hobby. Well, that little small six figure uh, speculation was became worth around fifty million dollars at the time that we had a conversation and met for coffee. And he engaged the services of some very, very good attorneys, created the foundation um, and but realized that his children and his wife really didn't care much for his magic internet money. Uh, his invisible money in the cloud. And so we had a great conversation about what he needed to do to protect those assets. But more importantly, 
how do you recover and release those assets for the charitable donations that uh, foundations that he was creating and for his family? So when I heard that story, I, I realized that it was time to write a book for financial professionals, for estate planning attorneys. And this is the main reason why. Typically, professionals will learn something and then share that information with their clients. If you're an attorney, if you're an attorney, you're sharing tax law. If you're an accountant, there's these new IRS rules that it's this top down approach to information with your clients. But in the world of cryptocurrency, it's not like that. What's happening is that financial planners and estate planning attorneys are getting phone calls from their clients saying, Hey, you know, that 10 grand of Bitcoin I bought a few years ago. Well, now it's worth 150 grand. And I want to include it in my estate plan. I want to keep it in inventory. I need to figure out a way of protecting it and making sure that my beneficiaries receive it. So now the conversation's the other way. It's a decentralized conversation, much like cryptocurrency, where it's not coming from the top down, it's coming from the bottom up. And so that's why I felt a very quick, uh, brief book on cryptocurrency designed specifically for estate planning attorneys, financial planners, and clients who engage those services you know, on professionals to say, hey, let's start a conversation. This is what cryptocurrency is. This is how I hold it. Uh, and this is my inventory. And I have I have a cute little spreadsheet uh, that's very helpful that can be, uh, you know, printed and given to your estate planning attorney or your beneficiaries. Again, it's just a way of keeping track of cryptocurrency. And especially if you die and you don't really leave very many clues behind, there's a way of kind of forensically finding and recovering your cryptocurrency just by looking at maybe your emails or your bank statements and some of your electronic digital uh, reports. So th it, it, that's that's really what the book is for, is for anybody that owns crypto, but specifically for those people that engage the services of an estate planning attorney or a financial planner. All right. Obviously, we don't have time to review the whole book. It'd be cool, though. People should definitely check it out. But uh, let's leave them with some uh, top tips, some takeaways, some things that every financial advisor should think about when they're looking at the cryptocurrency space and things they should be aware of when they're thinking about estate planning on that side, sir. Maybe some top three tips. Well, a top three tips, I would say one is you have to make sure that if the cell phone is lost or damaged in a car accident, that the biometric features uh, are not the only way you can potentially get into a phone if it's been broken or, 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 I mean, if it's been recovered and it's successfully in good shape because Apple and other companies will not release that information to you. Even if you have uh, all the estate planning documentation available, just because you have a, um, a, a, a cryptocurrency app on your phone doesn't mean that if you recover the phone successfully that you'll be able to get into it with a recovery phase. So it's important that the, the owner of the cryptocurrency have the seed phrase that is used to recover the wallet Two, that it's in a safe place, but not so safe where it's spread to the four ends of the earth by four different people. If you have this 12 word or 24 word seed phrase. And secondly, you also have to make sure that you have access to their bank statements because typically what happens is people will link, uh, say, for example, their Coinbase account. They'll link it with their uh, uh, Bank of America account, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, right? And they're making uh, dollar cost averaging or monthly contributions. And you'll see those on their bank statements. So make sure that as a financial planner and an estate planning attorney that you have ac access to other digital information, right? Bank statements uh, and cell phone records and potentially you have to have on paper, in my opinion, written down uh, those type of important, important items. Yeah, you know, that's an important one about the biometrics. We all just think, hey, you know, we can just put our fingerprint on our phone and just uh, use that for everything. <laughs> but you're right. If something like that gets damaged or something along those lines, all of a sudden your access to what could be very valuable assets could be limited or perhaps cut off entirely. So that in and of itself is an important takeaway. Again, listeners, if you're intrigued, if you're an advisor out there, you have clients who are starting to come to you looking uh, to dip their toes in these waters, or perhaps they already have done so, and you're trying to do some estate planning for them, there's literally only one book you can buy, and it is this, The Essential Estate Professionals Toolkit for Recovering Cryptocurrency, or just give Mr. Bill a search over there on Amazon. His last name is Ulivery, U-L-I-V-I-E-R-I. Give it a search. I think you will like what you're going to find as we keep on rolling right on into the earnings volatility report. 
Earnings announcements can move markets, but what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events? Let's find out with the Earnings Volatility Report. All right, everyone. It's a brand new year. That means a brand new earnings season. Luckily for you, we have the guy with us who's been crunching all the numbers on this for years. So he knows all the trends and what's cooking out there in the world of earnings vol. Uh, Mr. Matt, we'll start. Give us your final thoughts on how the last season wrapped up last year. And then what are you seeing so far for this cycle of 2024 here? Well, um, in, in a lot of the past earnings seasons, we've seen some market volatility. And it's generally been heightened at some point in the kind of six weeks that we look at. You know, that's a big contrast to this season. You know, volatility is relatively low. And what we're seeing is the implied moves of the stocks are a lot lower than the past earnings move, you know. And then the difference is, you know, the last earnings that, that we experienced in, in, uh, that started in October, you know, the, they had some pretty elevated implied moves. So the market was thinking that, that these moves would be greater than perhaps they were. This is, uh, th these are the best seasons to be long um, uh, straddles that we, met, that we measure already. The first, the first week, which is generally not very good, um, not a very good week from a, returns from long uh, straddles has been positive. You know, generally that first week isn't that positive. And we we're seeing uh, valuations that are, you know, 10% below, meaning the implied move is divided by the past earnings moves average is about 10% lower. So what we're seeing this earnings season, and again, it's just begun, is much lower uh, relative implied earnings moves. So again, that gets exciting. I mean, in, in my eyes, you know, when it's, you know, we, we went through COVID and, you know, really uh, the long option straddle owners were getting blown out because on top of, a, of an already uh, volatile uh, market with high implied volatility, you know, they were, they were having to add more volatility for earnings and that just wasn't panning out. So, uh, you know, that's what I'm seeing so far, Mark, and, and uh, that's the big contrast of this earnings season is that it, we're coming into it with a much lower volatility and we're going to see some, you know, I think more people concentrate on the actual earnings. And so I think it's going to get quite volatile and it could even uh, move this market down. I mean, it could be a, a catalyst to move this market down when we get in the third or fourth week. And some, you know, because a lot of, you know, this market has really been driven by the bigger firms. Uh, there's just a few firms that are really driving this market. So when, when the uh, smaller firms start to, start to report, I think that, you know, we have it, we have a chance to shake this market up a bit, Mark. It's impossible, sir. This market can do naught but go up, carried on the wings of AI. But you know, you made a good point. It is fascinating to watch just how much the market and expectations can evolve just from one cycle to the next. As you mentioned, last cycle is all about outperformance. I think the, it finished the, the cycle 119%, somewhere around that. So one of the more explosive cycles we've seen since we've been crunching these numbers. And now fast forward just a few weeks into the new year, and you're right, it's going the other way. It's vols coming in, and we're looking at a lot lower vol levels for a lot of these names, which again, it's fascinating what a difference just a few weeks can make out there in the markets. And speaking of a few weeks, or indeed a few months, we now have all the data in our hot little hands for December, so let's get to the buzz. Earnings announcements can move markets, but what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events? Let's find out with the Earnings Volatility Report. All right, everybody, welcome to the buzz, the portion of the show where we break down the biggest stories you may have missed in the world of options because you're busy dealing with your clients. We get it. And the biggest story, the number one overarching story that we've really been tracking here for the better part of the last couple of years, and it continued into last year and indeed into this year in the options world, is what's going on with the volume? What's going on with the numbers? Are people still trading these things in the numbers they were, let's say, in the early explosive days of the pandemic or indeed the bonkers period that was the meme stock palooza when Everything was turned on its head, and everyone and their mother and their grandmother were all trading options. Well, we now have the numbers for December of last year, and we also have the numbers 
for the full year of 2023. So we can reveal whether it was a, a winning year or not. First up, December. December volume surprisingly strong. You know, December not known for being the most rock'em, sock'em robots of months. Obviously, we have the holiday season towards the latter portion of December. People usually take the latter portion of the month off. Markets are pretty thin, pretty light, so no one expects a banger options month and yet we had a pretty strong month it wasn't quite the 1 billion level that we've hit earlier in the year but it was still surprisingly strong 916 million contracts going up in december that's up seven percent from december of 2022 so again a, a banger month number seven in terms of overall volume for the year if you rank all the months of the year the number one month out there was march of course the contagion fears drove us to the First ever 1 billion contract level, and that was 1.059 billion contracts. So not quite there, not quite contagion level, but certainly respectable. In the top 10 of busiest months of all time in the options market. So you certainly can't look askance at that. And then you take that and extrapolate that out to the full year. And you can see 2023 was a banger year. 11.1 billion contracts changing hands last year. Already beating the north of 10 billion we just managed to eke by last year. That was already a ridiculous level. And now we're at 11.1 billion contracts. The ADV now in the options market, 44.4 million contracts. That's how many contracts are going up every day in the options market. These are numbers that were unthinkable just a few years ago. Now, I mentioned I just came off that panel last week. That was a fascinating one. It was myself. It was our buddy, the flow master, Mr. Henry Schwartz from SIBO. We had uh, Mr. JJ Kinahan, who now runs IG Group, so a big brokerage group. And of course, on the crypto front, we had our buddy, Greg Magadini, who provides all the analytics for our crypto rundown show. So it was a fascinating cross-section of a panel. One of the contentious issues we discussed was this. Is there Maybe a little bit more going on behind the scenes from a volume perspective than maybe you might think. And maybe these numbers not quite as strong as you might think. You might say, hey, 11.1 billion contracts, 44.4 million ADV. What's possibly wrong with that? You start digging under the hood, though, you might see some troubling trends. But what was the biggest trend of last year in the options world? It was zero DTE by far, right? And you can see that very starkly reflected in these numbers, listeners. If you look at the overall equity options volume, so... You know, your Apples and your Teslas and your NVIDIAs, all the things you folks trade day to day outside of the indexes. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of growth there. In fact, it was pretty much flat, up a half a percent. That overall segment of the market was only up 26 million contracts year over year. It's pretty much half of a day's volume is the only <laughs> increase we saw in overall equity options volume. So that stuff, the Apples, NVIDIAs and Teslas of the world, no growth to be found there whatsoever what we did see growth in was the etf options up 11.6 percent and index options up 33.1 percent so both of those carrying us pretty much to where all the growth came from this past year total up 7.1 percent for the entire business on the year so that raises the question and maybe mr bill we'll start with you once you start digging into these numbers a little bit and obviously they look good on the surface but once you start pulling out this hot new phenomenon known as zero day, which is obviously driving those ETF and index numbers, it makes you wonder, would we have been flat or maybe even down on the year without those? So, Mr. Bill, what are your thoughts on the, the volume tsunami we've seen post-pandemic? And do you think it can continue or is it all now on the backs of just these zero day and, and maybe that's a fad? Maybe that won't be here for that long. Gosh, Mark, that's really a great question. And I, I have to be honest with you. I think I'm too old in this business to almost have an, an opinion. Because when I first started at the Chicago Board Options Exchange, we did maybe, we had like an 80 million share day on a New York Stock Exchange. And my wife was actually working for Shaq in the clearing firm back then, my, my soon-to-be wife. She she worked, like, they got hotel rooms for all the back office clearing people to to stay behind. Because it took 10 days of moving paper cards and paper trading statements. And, you know, they were using, they didn't have Excel back then. I think they had QuickBooks or something crazy that they had all this stuff on. And so my perspective of like an 80 million share day shutting down the, practically the exchanges to now doing billions and billions of contracts, like I can't, I almost can't wrap my head around that. And the truth is you and I have had this other conversation before 
where the zero days the conversation. I just I don't understand it. Um, I I I I, I kind of get it, but I mean, if if that's what if that's what we're going to, then you know, managing risk in in literally zero days, right? You're only today. I just don't see how that's risk management. I don't call that risk management. I mean, maybe Matt has a different opinion. Really, I have to defer to him, but I think he's been in the business as long as I have. And he has to be shaking his head saying, you know, as a professional money manager, as an asset manager, I, I don't do zero days to expiration. Who does this? Help me understand because I'm buying three month options. I'm buying two month options. I'm buying, you know, the VIX ETF. Uh, volatility or, or or inverse ETFs for my clients because while there may be some embedded decay in these option uh, in the exchange traded funds, at least I don't have to look at it every three and a half hours. Like, help me with this, Matt. <laughs> Mr. Matt, you have been invoked, sir. Obviously, the strong volume trend is encouraging, but you start looking behind the scenes. Are, are you a little concerned, Matt, that maybe these volume numbers are starting to get propped up on things that could potentially be unsustainable, sir? I'm not, actually. And I think I actually think zero DT is a, is a logical and, and, and a, a, actually a very good thing for, you know, people, you know, I'm an old finance guy. I'm, you know, my I, I remember sitting around and listening to my grandfather and uncle and dad talking about stocks. Um, and nine million was a lot of, of actual shares <laughs> that traded hands. So um, I remember I used to chart things by hand and I traded my first derivative when I was like nine years old, a warrant on AIG. So, um, you know, I, but I, you know, I got into finance and and I think that this is important. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, zero DTEs are, you know, and we have a lot of this data, um, you know, it's it's allowing financial planners, you know, and, and companies and, you know, they're getting down in, if you look at any, one of, of the industries like, you know, credit card information, they know where shoppers are at every second. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, tr tankers and where, where all the tankers are in the ocean right now. And, and what's the economy game going to be like? Well, options are doing the same thing. And, and people are needing to know, like, what, what is, what is the option market think about tomorrow or what's the implied move of the FOMC in three days, you know, all of those things are very much helped by the zero DTEs and, and you know, and all the the weeklies that, that stack up around it, you know, people could start to plan a lot better. So it's, it's a super important uh, function of the economy that traders are, are giving out to all the participants. And this is a, a big deal. And um, it's going to be very difficult to do apples and such, you know, with the, the clearing firms and and dividends and all those issues. But, you know, these indexes are uh, very telling. And, you know, it's not, you know, there's obviously gamb gamblers out there, but, you know, it's it's it, these people are, are doing a ton of work. We're doing a ton of back tests. We have minute by minute data that, that we're selling that helps people figure out, you know, trading opportunities throughout the day, you know, what to do in the first 10 minutes, what to do in the last 10 minutes, what to do during the day. You know, this is an important thing that, uh, an important information that we're giving out and, you know, by, by doing this trading that seems like gambling. It's actually super, uh, super uh, important. And I think it's gonna lead to a lot more uh, sophistication in uh, other areas that people could look at and see, you know, how's this next week shaping up? Uh, what's implied from the market? You know, what kind of decisions should we make? And then, you know, the, with the AI bringing in a lot, a lot more of that other type of information that I talked about earlier. So, you know, that's that's my opinion on the on the zero DTEs. And I don't think it's a, you know, I mean, I think I think that is just going to continue to grow. Uh, we're going to see more and more symbols um, going that way. And you know, so I I don't think it's a weakness. I think it's a strength, and I think it's a good benefit for the economy, Mark. Well, since we're getting deep into the zero DTE debate, we might as well get to the office hours. We have a question right along those lines. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start 
our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on theoptionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at theoptionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or stocktwits.com slash optionsinsider. All right, everybody, welcome to the Office Hours, a portion of the show where you folks take the range, your questions, your comments. Uh, we have a question of the week, but I want to get right to this question here from, looks like Neil. Interesting spelling of Neil, if it is. If it's not Neil, I apologize, but looks like Neil. I'm going to go with Neil. Neil Thompson, uh, he writes in, this question is for the Advisors Options podcast. Well, you send it to the right place, Neil. He says, I know you had Steve Sears on this show a while back, and I've been reading his Striking Price column for years. I found his recent comments about zero-day options somewhat surprising and wanted to get your thoughts on the matter. Did it surprise you as well? Thanks and love the show. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve was on, I think, a little over a year ago. He has a new uh, startup where they're doing covered calls out there. And so he was on to talk about that. But you're right, he has been writing the striking price for years. Uh, he did have some interesting thoughts on all things zero day. Uh, spoiler alert, he's not a fan, listeners. I'm not going to read the whole column to you folks, but I'll give you the highlights here. He says the options market could have a winning role here if the industry doesn't let so-called zero-dated options overshadow the meaningful ways investors can use options to better navigate the stock market. Uh, the popularity of zero-dated options, which are often used to echo anticipate or anticipate stock market moves, will continue to be a risk to the market's stability as they could amplify its trading patterns. Uh, the industry defends these as these trading patterns of these gambling chits, that's what you first them do, gambling chits as harmless, but investors are well served to remember the Valmageddon back of 2018. Uh, he goes on to say, if exchanges don't harm the market by introducing even more products that kowtow to the worst instincts of investors, options should make deeper strategic inroads into investor portfolio allocations. Then he goes on to talk about a covered call fund, which is kind of talk in his book, so we, we won't get into that side of it. His argument is that there's other things the industry could be doing that would actually potentially drive more volume rather than, as he puts it, kowtowing to the lowest common denominator, which are the, as he views it, are these uh, zero-day options. He says, put it, pandering to speculators who goose trading volumes and transaction fees. So, yeah, fair to say he's not a fan, and he is not alone. The industry seems to be split on how they view these things. We have a lot of people who've been in the options and derivatives world for a long time. Like Scott Nations, I could think of a lot of others. Bill, sounding like he's kind of on the negative side as well. A lot of people take a bit of a dim view of these things. So it is very much uh, very much still a contentious issue. Mr. Bill, I guess we'll start with you because you're, you're along the same lines of Steve here. Maybe a little bit of a skeptic of these. Uh, what are your thoughts of Steve's points? Are you, like our listener points out, he was surprised. Are you surprised to hear these thoughts? Or is this kind of what you were thinking about zero day as well, sir? Well, I think it's what I, I also feel about the zero days. I mean, again, from my perspective, you know, an investment advisor, I'm managing IRA 401ks, and I spend a lot of time looking at data, dwelling, uh, figuring out how things are going to work out, and the best way to hedge portfolio, whether it's inverse ETFs or whether it's options on an individual basis. And, and I do have a few options on, on the sheets for a couple of clients with the stock position that they just want to manage a little bit. But again, my perspective is, you know, the, the zero data operation, uh, zero data expiration is kind of when you go into a gas station and you fill up your tank and you're like, well, you know, in addition to a car wash, I'm going to get a scratch, a scratch ticket and just see how I do like this kind of impulsive type position, uh, a decision to buy. And so again, um, you know, I, I, I'm looking at the VIX now at 12 and a quarter, 12 and a half. I want to buy volatility because we're in an election year. We have, uh, you know, they say that as January goes, so goes the market. And we've got, you know, roughly, you know, we don't have all that much to shake a stick at in terms of returns. I mean, we have the Russell 2000 is down, you know, two and a quarter percent. Natural gas down almost two. The S&P 500 up 1.9. QQQ up three and a half. So, you know, we're a month into the year. And I think things are going to be, we're going to have like a sideways, if not a more volatile year because of, of the election coming up. So, but, but I wouldn't do it with a zero data expiration. I just, I'm just, and I, and I really would like to ask Matt, I mean, 
I, like I know that when I do a covered call right, I'll look at an option and I'll say, okay, well, the stock is 50. I'm selling the 50 call for X number of dollars, and I'm going to make a 2 or 3 or 4% static rate of return from now until expiration. But if I had to do that 250 times a year, <laughs> okay, or – you know, for the number of trading days per year, like how does that add up in terms of rate of return? Like I would, maybe Matt can help me. Like maybe this is where it's the greatest of all covered calls to do because you're doing it every single day. Maybe the static yield is not 4% between now and the next three months, but maybe it's 40% using di zero days of expiration. And I want to be the seller of this, like until the cows come home. So I don't know. I mean, it's just a my perspective has changed since I left the trading floor, Mark. And, and, and maybe that's part of the problem too. Well, Matt, we did just discuss this with our great covered call debate on options boot camp. So if you have any answers for Mr. Bill, he's wondering if he should be selling his covered calls in more zero dated rather than going out a few months. And then B, for our listener, Neil, who was a little bit surprised about Steve Sayers' comments about all things zero day. If you have any thoughts for him as well, have at it, sir. A two-parter for you. I think my, my brain is going to explode, Mark, because I have so many things to say, but let me try to <laughs> make it coherent. For in for covered calls, you know, again, uh, the way stocks work is you make your money in just a few days, and then if you if you're if you get called away on those few days, you're going to have a tough time uh, with the rest. So you have to be very careful with covered calls, and you know, a long term like you're doing way, far, um, you know, what we found in our testing was, you know, farther out, more out of the money, and consistently, and and that's that's the best way to do that type of strategy, but. <clears throat> Again, I, you know these. Uh, you know I've met Stephen, and, and he's a very bright guy, and, and you know he's done well for himself in the market. And a, you know a lot of these other guys, you know that we've uh, had on and talked about over the year, uh, Mark, that said you know this is going to be volume again and again. And you know I, I, I think I presented a very good argument for why it wouldn't be, and as a matter of fact, it, why it would dampen volatility and be better for the market. Um, and I think that's coming to pass. We're seeing, or see, every day that goes by, you know, it's helping my case. It's, you know, it's just, it's just not what what people think. Um, and and you know, it's it's not for the covered call riders potentially, but there's a lot of other uh, trading strategies and things to do and 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 uh, markets to understand by what's going on in the zero DT heat. Imagine, you know, Bill and I and and Mark, you know, we we're all market makers. We had these positions on. And you know, like you, you just get these positions shoved down your throat, and a lot of this is what was happening to to the the few market makers that are out there right now. But what zero DTE has given these market makers is the ability to manage their positions a lot uh, better. You know, we and you could see the evidence in the put call slope. Like we measure that very carefully, and the slope has never been shallower. So what that means is the puts are versus the calls are are closer to equal when for the longest time they've were the puts were much higher than the calls and there and my theory and I think it's it's backed up pretty well is that you had banks and hedge funds and that needed to buy protection and they would and they would do covered calls so the market makers position would be short calls uh, excuse me long calls and short puts and so what they would do is they would jack up. You would see it in the market. The volatility would be a lot higher in the puts. They want people to come in and sell puts to them. Well, with the, with the zero DTE, what we found is that it's the, the paper or the trading is much more two-way. And, and the market makers are able to, to um, hedge off their positions a lot easier. And, you know, one day, two day, three day. So, so now the market makers have the ability not to be you know typically what they were before short puts and long calls so they could they could uh you know flatten out their positions a lot better and that's great for everyone i mean they don't need to chase the stock when that you know and sell 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 when the market's going down and you know and and then when the market goes up they were always dampening so you know i think that that's helped the market it's helped the volatility it's helped the price discovery um, because these these huge positions that the banks had on against the market makers have allowed them just to have a more stable type of a, of a position. And I think, you know, like I said, every day that goes by where there's not a bulb again, 
you know, the, all these people were saying, we're going to get a huge crash. That's, you know, look at all this notional, I mean, it's just complete nonsense. And and what, that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing it's it's a benefit to the market. It's a smart thing to do. People are studying this more than you can imagine. Again, you know, we sell the data to them and we talk to them and we help them with back testing. So, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, like I said, you know, people misunderstand the zero TTE and, you know, to the detriment of, of I think, you know, Steve Sears, I, you know, it doesn't look good for him. And I don't think it's going to look good for, you know, his opinion coming up. You know, I think I don't think he's right. So that's, that's how I feel about that, Mark. All right, we're going to have to leave it there, listeners. Man, what a fun journey started out in crypto, got into zero day and all sorts of fun in between. But before we go, listeners, let's go back around the horn. Well, let's start with Mr. Bill. Mr. Bill, sir, if folks are intrigued, some advisors want to check out your book. Where should they go? What should they do? Well, you can always go to Amazon and do a search for cryptocurrency estate planning, and you'll find my book there. Or give our offices a call at 847-686-4800. You know, we'd be happy to, you know, do some consulting uh, in this space to help you uh, understand how cryptocurrency recovering it might be a benefit to your clients. So either Amazon and grab a copy of the book. We'd appreciate uh, the support. Or give us a call again at our offices at 847-686-4800. And we can do a Zoom call and... Um, teach your clients how to uh, keep a good inventory of their crypto assets and uh, the proper types of uh, steps that are needed to be in place before um, you meet your days to ex before you go to zero days to expiration. And we, you want to have this kind of stuff in order. There you go. Check it out. Listeners. That book again is called the essential estate professionals toolkit for recovering cryptocurrency or search for Mr. Bill over there at Amazon. Last name U-L-I-V-I-E-R-I, -I -E -I, listeners. And Mr. Matt, if folks want to reach out to you to talk, maybe maybe debate Zero Day with you or talk about effective covered call strategies or unleash auto on their portfolio or anything else, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, this is a great show. Thanks, Mark and, and Bill. I really uh, appreciate that, uh, and, and uh, I love the zero DTE humor too. So, um, <laughs> and, and you know, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna force me, like, you know, to get my uh, communicate my uh, my uh, holdings of, of Bitcoin. Although I've been doing that, but I, I, you know, it's super important that people do that. So, so uh, you know, it's great to have Bill on and remind me, and hopefully remind a lot of others to uh, to get all their ducks in a row uh, by the time the, their zero, zero DTE comes around. So uh, and if you want to uh, talk to me, Matt at orats.com, uh, you know, like I said, we have a ton of stuff going on. We want to we want to be the best platform for research, for risk management, for implementation and for review. Um, so you should check it out over at orats.com and uh, see what's going on. We just uh, came out with a orats university, Mark. So. Uh, we're trying to teach and we're trying to give uh, the best tools and the best data to people so they can compete out there. So thanks a lot for a great show, Mark. Orats University. Sounds interesting. Check it out, listeners. Orats.com, O-R-A-T-S.com, the place to go to begin that journey to the dark side. Of course, check out our friends. We were just talking about all their data over there as well at the Options Clearing Corp and indeed their educational arm, the Options Industry Council. A lot of good content there as well. Optionseducation.org the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. That's going to do it for us today on the Network Options Bootcamp is live to tape, so it should already be hitting the network as we speak. If you're on the pro side, of course, you already heard that episode last week. Mr. Dan is traveling. We'll be back live with that show next week. Also, Little Birdie tells me that that recording of that panel we made last week uh, should be hitting the pro sometime soon as well. So if you're on the pro side, you couldn't make it into Chicago. Maybe you just didn't want to fly into Chicago when it was sub-zero weather. I get it. Didn't want to shell out the ticket for the conference over there, which was not cheap. I get it, listeners. Well, look, guess what? We got you covered on the pro. Head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash pro, and you'll get access to everything we put up there, including great exclusives for our pro members, like all these cool events and conferences that we go to, including this panel. So that was a fun one as well, as well as, of course, Options Oddities. Great pro Q&A sessions. Just had a great one all about zero DTE options yesterday on the pro Q&A side. So if you want to learn more about this stuff, that is definitely the place to go. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. 
back again with our usual array of content throughout the week, listeners, until we're back again here on the network for another episode of The Advisor's Option. Stay safe out there, everybody. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com.